All right, thank you. So, I actually thought sitting might be better, but I think I'm going to stand because I just can't not teach without standing for some reason, most of the time. Um, but as some of you know, I battled a mountain lion um, a couple of Thursdays ago, saving a student, uh, a parent drop off, and uh, hurt my toe kicking a tombstone over on its head. I didn't have my phone, so I couldn't actually take a picture of it. So I have no proof of the mountain lion. Um, and uh, yeah, so, and don't ask what happened to the mountain lion. Um, but uh, no, I actually, my foot massager uh, got the best of me and my bone. So uh, I can actually bend it a little bit more uh, today and it doesn't have near the pain. I haven't had pain medicine for two and a half days now, so that's good. Uh, but I stubbed it twice yesterday doing a musical set, and let me tell you, I knew that I stubbed it, and so did everybody around me. Um, and of course, you know, being at a theater, you know, they're like, wow, you're really dramatic. You should have been a theater kid. <laughs> and Joanna was there, so she didn't let it go either. But uh, I guess I missed my calling on that part. Um, so, but yeah, so sometimes it hurts, sometimes it doesn't. So. If I sit down, it, it might be bothering me, but whatever. <laughs> All right, so uh, if you want to, you can turn uh, in your Bibles. We'll get there eventually today. Deuteronomy chapter 6. Uh, we'll be in verses 4 to 9. Uh, it's part of, uh, I have 10 life verses, or I should say some of my life verses are actually passages, because uh, this is a couple verses, so it's a little portion of Scripture that uh, I keep dear to my heart. And, uh, you know, studying... Uh, pneumatology, by the way, is how you say this. Pneumatology. Uh, we'll break down the word a little bit later, but it's the study of the Holy Spirit. And uh, before we get into that, we've been studying uh, about two ologies. I started with theology proper, which was God the Father, and then Pastor Brad talked about Christology, which was God the Son. Uh, two persons of the Trinity, believe it or not. So now guess what? We're going to go to the third. So it kind of makes sense in the sequence. Um, but theology proper, uh, if I could take and summarize, uh, this is a very broad summarization of it, but uh, it's the most fundamental aspect of Christian theology, uh, covering the existence, character, and works of God the Father. Uh, basically talked about, you know, just everything he is, uh, who he is, uh, what he has done, um, and his uh, position uh, as God. Uh, Christology. Uh, to take everything that Christ has done, would you can't kind of summarize it into a sentence, but I tried, uh, is the essential to the all-important existence and work of Jesus Christ as the very Son of God, dying in substitution to save us. Um, so God himself coming down uh, to save us. Right? Uh, there's a lot more to both of these, um, but I just wanted uh, just a quick little uh, synopsis here. Uh, so then we move to pneumatology, uh, and pneumatology, uh, if you look down at the bottom, it's broken up from two words, pneuma and logos. Uh, pneuma uh, in the uh, Greek means breath, wind, or spirit, right? and then logos is a word, a thought, a principle, or a speech. Uh, a lot of times people put study next to this uh, because that's kind of what it is. It's a thought. You know, it's a speech, you know, you're studying, you're, you're talking, you're explaining a topic. And what are you explaining? Well, you're explain, explaining pneuma, which is breath, wind, spirit, which are names given to the Holy Spirit. Uh, so that's how we kind of get pneumatology. And the Holy Spirit in a one sentence, uh, if I could break it down, he is the only one to apply and work out the redemption as it is in Christ Jesus our Lord. There's no other to apply and perfect that salvation in us. And, I mean, I could go right down to the bottom of my whole study and say, do you realize God lives in you? I mean, in this whole study, in a nutshell, if you have put your faith in Christ, as Scripture says in the New Testament, the Holy Spirit, God himself, lives in you. I mean, that in an essence is like, wow. All right? And how many people actually stop and think about it? I know I never did until I started studying this. Um, and it, it's amazing that God himself lives in us. And uh, it's only through that that we can even be in the Lord's presence. And I'll explain that later um, 
with uh, salvation's work in the, in the New Testament. Um, but just think about that. When we go through the study of pneumatology, that God lives in you. I do a study on uh, superhero, right? And part of the superheroes, we're all superheroes because we have that Holy Spirit living in us and it's that power that we have of prayer, right? We just prayed, you know? And uh, if we just knew exactly how much power is in us and the power of prayer, I mean, some of us do, right? <laughs> right, because we've experienced it. And I think we've kind of reaped the benefits of a blessing of answered prayer and some of us haven't. And it might make us go the other way and have doubt. I know a lot of people have prayer journals and they keep track of it. Um, and, you know, it's just one of those things where uh, as I try to pray for God's will and I talk to people about God's will, it's all about um, His timing, right? And you have the yes, no, maybe, I wait, I have something better, uh, maybe this is what I'll give you instead and sometimes we miss it. But, but the power, right, is the working redemption that is always working in us because God lives in us. So when we make a mistake and, you know, we ask for forgiveness and we're cleansed, you know, right? And we're made white as snow again, you know, that's how God, right? When we're standing in front of God on judgment day, you know, he sees Christ in us. He doesn't see our faults. He doesn't see our failures. He sees Christ living in us. And that's where we'll get to eventually. Um, but that is what that one little sentence, uh, if I could kind of just... Um, break it down. So then on the bottom here, we have exactly what it is, and I kind of took the theology proper. It's a study uh, on the existence, attributes, and works of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and let me tell you, there's a lot. <laughs> there is a lot. Uh, it's incredible. Um, but I'm going to start with asking you, what do you know? <laughs> uh, what do you know? What Bible verses are on the top of your head about the Holy Spirit? Uh, what teachings may might you have already heard, uh, and what books maybe you've read? And you know, I don't know how long I when I put this on here. I'm like, well, somebody might stand up and start teaching, and then I can sit down. But um, I don't know. So just share something, you know, simple, you know, uh, a thought. If there's nothing, that's fine. I'll keep moving on. But what's something that maybe you've heard or read or a verse that pops out to you? I will not be surprised if there's nothing because uh, yeah, one of my notes. Natalie wants to raise her okay. hand. She does. <laughs> yeah. Well. Okay. Peer pressure. Here All right. We go. Well, I guess John 16, um, at least in my Bible, says the work of the Holy Spirit. So clearly, it talks about the work of the Holy Spirit there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. Yep. And my mind went to John 14 through 16, where Jesus talks about the Comforter that's going to come and be poured out as he talks to his disciples. And the other one was 1 Corinthians 2, where Paul talks about how like um, you can only understand the Bible through the Spirit. Um, and he talks about there, I think it's verses like 14 through 17. And he talks about the way that like we understand this, the Word through the Spirit. So the Holy Spirit's pretty important. You'll, you'll find that out. Um, because uh, the Holy Spirit does a lot more than what we could ever imagine. Uh, I, I want to tell you, uh, in studying this and reading just you know, theologians who have studied it and scholars who have, have studied the Holy Spirit, they all start the same way. And the sense that they, they start with is, the Holy Spirit is probably the least understood, most understudied, and yet most extremely fascinating of the Holy Trinity. It's, it's like we just kind of push the Holy Spirit to the side. You know, we talk about God the Father, we talk about uh, God the Son, but then the Holy Spirit, right? Um, so uh, there's a clear need for uh, a doctrinal presentation or study on pneumatology. Um, and as I studied this, uh, I couldn't tell you that, you know, it weighed heavy on me, uh, the importance of the Holy Spirit. And this might be why I got this, because it is a tough subject. Uh, it's very weighty. Um, it, understanding how the Holy Spirit works in us um, is exactly what the previous slide said. Um, that's how 
you know, God sees our justification and sanctification and our forgiveness through our faith in Christ and, and Him living us. So the our, what I would call victorious Christian living kind of centers around understanding the Holy Spirit. Uh, ministries in church kind of center around it. I mean, we're praying. Um, and so the design that I have set up uh, is going to take us through a lot. And I'll have a little, the last slide I'll show you exactly uh, in depth. But in studying this, I could not get past studying the Trinity, obviously. I mean, I've already mentioned it a few times. So before we even get to uh, any further, um, this is just a little little uh, picture I, I found. And I thought it was kind of, you know, not exactly how it works, <laughs> um, but uh, you know, you see, we have the the Holy Spirit in, in us. That's not kind of how it works. We don't have a dove in us, um, but because uh, you know, people are like, well, how does the Holy Spirit live in you? Where is it, right? Um, and uh, so, uh, a popular statement uh, that I found very confusing, and maybe, you know, I understand it, but. Uh, goes like this. Try to understand the Trinity and you will lose your mind. But fail to understand the Trinity and you will lose your soul. Uh, now, the Trinity is not a logical contradiction. Um, God is three person, yet one essence. So we know the what of the Trinity. God's three person, one essence. Um, but the how of the Trinity is what boggles our little puny finite minds. We can't understand how three persons can be one essence. And that's gonna be the key for today's lesson, okay? Um, because we can know, we can couple the know with the unknown, um, and that just, like what we don't know about the Trinity is what should actually motivate us and compel us to worship God, because it's just so magnificent, right? Uh, here's another little, I love BC. So uh, here's one where you know, he has his glasses, he sees one cross, but then he trips and falls, his glasses fall off, and he, he sees three crosses you know, up, in the, up in the sky, and then he puts it back on, oh, three and one. Right. Um, how, does it, how is that possible? Right. I don't know. It just, right? It is. And uh, so found this picture. Uh, we have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit in a, in a little triangle here. Uh, one God, three persons. You know, the Father is not the Holy Spirit. The Father is not, uh, it, um, it's, it's God. They're all God, okay? Um, the Father is God. The Holy Spirit is God. So they're one. So it, it's kind of, it might be confusing, but they're all God. That's the, the center of this whole uh, concept. Okay, there are three people, but one God, right? Um, so it, it's different rules. It all comes down to, to the different rules. And hopefully this will help you explain a, a little bit more. They're all equal in every aspect, okay? But the rules are different. And the Father created the plan, the Son implemented and fulfilled the plan, and then the Spirit continuously administers the plan in us, all right? So... Um, three persons, but one. So how in the world do we kind of get the Holy Spirit as part of the Trinity? Uh, the Shema in Deuteronomy 6, 4-9 uh, is something that I've studied a little bit deeper, and hopefully this will explain it to you. So the Shema right here <laughs> in the Hebrew is very important. And I put this up here because if you don't know the Hebrew, and I never studied this in the Hebrew, and I've missed all of this, if you don't study the Hebrew, you actually miss a lot. So praise God that there are teachers that actually dig deep into studying stuff like this, because then they can kind of look deeper, and then there's more meaning. Because I've read Deuteronomy 6, 4, 100 million times. Well, not 100 million, but enough, okay? And it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Now, I've read that over and over and over, but that one verse right there is so significant. And if I can tie in my theology proper uh, lessons about the many different gods that the Canaanites had and how the Israelites were 
um, the bales of worship, how they were influenced <laughs> into different religions and different gods and, and just the, the mass uh, number of gods that they were influenced. And that word El, okay, the god El, it's going to center around that concept. Um, but here is the, the Shema. Um, and of course here is, is what it is. So we're only talking about verse 4 for right now. Right now. Um, but uh, break it down here. So I'll try not to talk too fast. <laughs> so in Deuteronomy 6, 4 to 9, we have uh, the word Elohanu. Now, if you look at your Bible, it says the Lord our God. Okay. Uh, the word here for God is Elohanu. All right. And that comes from Elohim or a form of uh, Elohim or Elohim. There's three different forms, okay? So I'll be saying Elohanu, Elohim, and Elohim. I don't even know if I'm saying it right, but those three are very important because if you look, and I was horrible in English, so learning this was like just twisting my brain. But Elohanu, it, the root word is the plural. Now plural, how many is plural? More than one, right? Is the plural form of Elohim. And then Elohim is the masculine plural form of Elohim. Okay, so this is why you need to know Hebrew, because the word here in Deuteronomy 6, 4, right, is uh, Elohanu, which means that we're talking about a plural form of God. So if they're using a plural form of God, then how did they know that God is more than one? Okay. And they might have gotten into the concept that, you know, taking this God, the sun God, the, the weather God, the, the fruit and vegetable God, and you know how they worshiped all these many gods. Well, they're saying, no, our God is one, but plural, because this God is in control of everything. Okay? Our God is one God, but it is master of all, right? We know that because God is the creator and master of all. So, once we know this, all right, uh, it translates to our gods, okay? Uh, the Elo, Elohanu in here uh, is the plural form, so it could kind of mean our gods, all right? A uh, better explanation might be found in Genesis 1.1. So, turn to Genesis 1.1. And here we have the Hebrew word Elo, Elohim which is the masculine plural form. So uh, anybody that wants to talk about whether God is a male or female, well, we're only using male, masculine forms of the word. So it's a man, <laughs> all right? Um, so plural, all right? Uh, so this was given to represent both a single and multiple deity used to specifically here uh, in Genesis 1-1 uh, for a single Hebrew God. So in Genesis 1-1, we have in the beginning God or Elohim created the heavens and the earth. Okay, Elohim here is very significant because again, it's the plural form uh, and it gives uh, divinity of God as the creator and then, uh, the numerous nations who believed in polytheism, naming their supreme god El, uh, their influence on the Israelites, leading them to worship many gods uh, here. Uh, and that's why God commanded them to worship him alone. So therefore, in this text, it applies that God is plural, more than one, uh, but stands as one being. All right. uh, so when you use a, a plural form there, uh, that's kind of where we're going. All right, so go back to Deuteronomy 6, 4 to 9. Because this is where uh, a simple word, the word one, is so significant here. Uh, the word one, uh, hero Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. The word one here in Hebrew is ehad, which means one or it's a unit within a unity, okay? So it's a whole bunch, if you take a, a one cube 
that we're talking about one cube out of a multiple cube. So uh, this word one here is significant because in Genesis uh, 1 5, it says uh, that <clears throat> that's Exodus. Genesis 1 5. talks about night and day and says God called the light day and the darkness he called night and there was evening and there was morning the first day okay or day one okay and the word one here is used to signify how the morning and evening are combined as one unit one day so it's two parts made into one okay. uh, Genesis 2.24 For this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and they will become one flesh. So it's taking that marriage of uh, man and woman, taking the man and the woman, two separate uh, parts, but combining them into one. Okay, so that's another way of using this word ihad here in scripture, combining into one flesh. Right? Uh, another way to look at this is during uh, the Exodus, uh, we had the Holy Spirit's guidance and presence in, um, in God's presence. Fire by night represents the Holy Spirit's righteous nature, uh, speaking of his purity, judgment, and refining presence. But then a, a, a cloud, okay, cloud and fire are opposites, but yet they were one. The fire led by night, the cloud um, by day, and the cloud provides coolness and shade, right? The fire is heat and light, but yet they work together as one unit. It's still God moving them uh, and providing the visual guidance that they needed as he uh, led them. So they work together as one item, or in this case, one person, to preserve the people during the day and the night. Uh, Genesis 1.5, if you go back to there, um, the two nouns that, that follow each other all right, constitute one day. In Genesis 2.24, man and woman, two joining together, creates one flesh. Uh, the word cleave is a key phrase meaning to stick to. Right, or glue together, having a permanent bond. You're taking two and gluing together, making one. So the whole purpose, if you go back to Deuteronomy 6 here, uh, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. We're taking the fact that uh, they, the gods that everybody had around them, the Hebrews here are saying our God is one. Right? And in this, Right? We know that God the Father, God the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Uh, we also have the word one in Ezra 2.64 and Nehemiah 7.66 when the word ehad is used to describe an assembly of over 42,000 people being one. All right? uh, so the word ehad does not necessarily refer to a single individual item, but it is a combination of items that constitute the whole. Uh, so therefore, uh, the Shema here in Deuteronomy 6.4 says that one whole that consists of several deities and the people of Israel must worship this wholeness in every aspect of their life. Uh, if I go back to that slide, you'll see, you know, they're telling them to put it on their hearts, tie it around their necks, uh, put it on their doorposts. They're supposed to, you know, worship God day and night when they wake up, when they lie down, when they go to work. I mean, it's telling them every part of life. And I've taught on this before. Um, so what's the important part of this? Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. So when we talk about the Holy Spirit, he's part of God, the Trinity. Um, so uh, as we continue to look forward to what the Holy Spirit has to offer, you know, don't just put them on the shelf. Uh, you know, I want you to actually, you know, start studying yourself, you know, um, look up scriptures, read them, 
Um, and, you know, it, it's really fascinating. Um, I'm trying to stay very calm because this, this right here just blew my mind a little bit. Anybody have any questions or maybe need anything explained a little bit more? Um, I'm, it's, this, was, this was a lot for me to kind of study and comprehend. Um, and uh, I, I hope I can give it clarity to you guys. Is there anything, any questions, or anybody want to add anything to, to this that maybe you've heard? Or whatever? Yeah. Yeah, to kind of go on, I don't want to jump ahead on you, but even in Genesis, it says, let us make man in our own image, which seems like a, that's, that's plural language right there. It's not, I will make man, it's let mm -hmm. us make man. Mm -hmm. And some people argue, you know, maybe he's talking to the angelic figure, but I don't think so. I mean, that was the trinity yeah. right there. Yeah. That'll be in my personhood, but yeah, yeah oh, I, no, I figured I was probably yeah, ahead. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, that's actually next next okay, week, okay. but yeah, but no, but that's yeah, that is a great passage to go to. Let us, well, who's us? <laughs> you know, and this is what's this is what really fascinated me because the Hebrew here talks about plural form, and like, I mean, they it's the the Holy Spirit working in them that they knew this. I mean, it's the only way we can even kind of fathom it. You know, or even even try to do this little study on it. I mean, we're just scratching the surface of because we just don't know. Here. Yeah. So in my uh, NIV translation, it has Deuteronomy six four with uh, four different translations together. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, there's a couple to different. Catch anything with that? So, I've uh, honestly in studying it, um, the one, and I'm not saying NIV, but. Uh, I think the best translation, and I did come across studying different translations, uh, the best one is the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Um, but you have to have that word one uh, because that's what ties everything together in my opinion. Um, so you know, I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm, I'm just saying the Hebrew there uh, goes with the Elohanu and all the other parts of the, how the sentence was written. Um, the, the whole key there is Lord is one. I mean, if it doesn't have Lord is one, then, I mean, uh, I, I'm not saying it's wrong, but it's just, yeah, that's what I studied um, personally. So. Does anybody have any other translations? <laughs> not to, like, because the Bible's the Bible, okay? Um, study it. I, I like different translations in NASB or... You know, King James and, and stuff. So, you know, yeah, my, my English standard has a footnote that includes a couple of different alternatives. So, my verse properly reads as you read, which I don't. Are you reading ESV? NIV. NIV. Okay. That is the same word. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. But the alternatives are the Lord our God is one Lord, or the Lord is our God, the Lord is one, or the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. But yeah, the word alone. The same, yeah. like there's a thread through all of those, which is, a, as you said, mm -hmm. is that emphasis on the, the oneness, the wholeness of the essence mm -hmm. of God. So it's kind of like remixes of the same thing yeah. in terms of like how they're translating it, yeah. which is just the way in which translation works. There's hardly ever like a one-to-one -one way in which you translate stuff. So it can, there is a low level of variance, mm -hmm. which is why there's so many different translations, but regardless, we don't have to get talking about that. Um, but yeah. Yeah, the word the, alone was the other translation. Yeah. I think that's the only other one I think I, I noticed. Yeah. Um, you know. But alone, I don't think the word alone does it justice because, yeah. you know, I, I think one is just, yeah. So, uh, so going back to uh, Deuteronomy 6, 4 to 9, so now that we know this, all right, and by the way, the, the Shema is, um, the Shema here, okay, is very significant, right? Uh, this is what, uh, um, this is what uh, is a foundational stone and centerpiece of Judaism, during their morning and evening prayer. They repeat it morning and in the evening. Uh, it's their most essential prayer. Uh, and it's an affirmation of God's singularity and kingship 
des deserving of our devotion and worship. And it starts out, Hero Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And then, of course, we get the, the wonderful phrase that Jesus uh, quotes eventually in his teaching. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. Okay? That is what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to worship God with every single part of us right? um, because he is one. He is control of everything. And then how do we do this? Um, you know, we do it on our hearts. Impress them on your children. Uh, talk to them when you sit at home, right? When you're at home, when you walk along the road, when you go to work, uh, when you lie down, when you, you know, when you go to bed, when you get up in the morning, right? Write them symbols on your hands and, and foreheads, tie them, right? Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. Right? Uh, so it's very significant in Judaism and it's their... Um, most uh, precious prayer that, that they can, can uh, offer. And it's a reminder. So one of the things that I wanted to talk about also is progress, pr progress of doctrine. And this simply, simply means that everything written in the Old Testament, right, we, they didn't know. And doctrine had to progress all the way to the New Testament. So when we study the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit was kind of just, well, you know, unknown or just a different concept in the Old Testament, but it wasn't until the, the New Testament that we could actually combine what the, was revealed in the New Testament by both Jesus' words and the Holy Spirit himself and go back to the Old Testament and gain a better clearing, uh, understanding and clarity of what the Holy Spirit did in the Old Testament. So it's just that idea of progress of doctrine where um, more is known. And do we know everything? Absolutely not. Um, so while there's truths in, about the Trinity and the Holy Spirit found in the Old Testament, it's only in the New Testament that the full doctrine is revealed. Um, so we must emphasize the doctrine of the Trinity uh, is not plainly revealed. There's a lot of questions. Right? Um, and, but the teaching of the New Testament were made aware of some of these truths. So we interpret the Bible, study its truth, read the context in full in language, the Hebrew and the Greek. We compare the scriptures, and that is what I hope to do as we look at a lot of different uh, areas of the Trinity and, and the Holy Spirit uh, specifically. All right. Uh, I want you to, C.S. Lewis, <laughs> you know, Pastor Brad was talking about him, and it's funny that I came across this because he even wrote on the Holy Spirit. Uh, but he says it all too well. Uh, he, I never read this book, Mere Christianity, but he explains the Trinity in his book this way. Imagine a line that's one-dimensional. That's God. Now imagine a square. It's two-dimensional. Okay. Now I picked a triangle, though, because uh, of the three God. Okay. So maybe you can see. So we know that um, God is God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Now let's take a cube. It's three-dimensional. Each thing is built upon the last, and if you were to see the line, or then the square, in a two-dimensional plane, you would have no idea the depth of the object under the surface. And that's the Trinity. It's not always possible for us to see how it all is one, because we see on a one- or two-dimensional plane, but when you understand more, you can see more, and the more it all makes sense. Okay? Um, our teachers would know that, but I, I don't see, I see, I see like the two dimensional, but the deeper I went, <laughs> the more depth I got <laughs> in this and then the more clarity. Uh, so that's kind of what he was saying. So when, uh, we've studied God, the father, God, the son. So now I'm going to ask you to brace yourself because we're going to take a, a deep dive into the Holy spirit and let's, we're going to, I call it the 3d study of, of God, the three dimensional study of God. Uh, the Holy Spirit. Um, so hopefully we'll we'll get there, because this is what we're actually going to cover, <laughs> if I can. <laughs> the divinity of the Holy Spirit, the personhood of the Holy Spirit, uh, the workmanship of the Holy Spirit, uh, the revelation of the Holy Spirit, and then the Old Testament ministry, because it was different than the New Testament, and then we'll close with the New Testament ministry of the Holy Spirit. Um, 
the first two, or actually the first three, we could probably do next week. Um, and then, uh, so we're looking at a couple weeks here of going through this. Um, but uh, that's kind of where we're headed. So pray for me. <laughs> Because <laughs> uh, I did a, a quick overview and I'm digging deeper into it. Um, but uh, that is going to be our study on the Holy Spirit. So, um, any questions or thoughts that you want to add? Uh, I was really excited to, to do this Deuteronomy 6 4 and, and how the, the Hebrew tied it all together um, with the language. But, any closing thoughts or comments or questions from you? I hope I didn't confuse you too much. My brain's hurting right now. <laughs> but it was exciting. Um, so so the next time you read it, you know, and if anybody asks about the Trinity or anything, uh, you can take them to Deuteronomy 6.4 and then take them back to Genesis 1.1, 1, 1, uh, then Genesis 2.24, uh, and then, of course, you know, let us make image you know so i'll give you more uh in that as well um, but um yeah yes i think i'll speak for myself on this one but um you know i think as humans we're, we're pretty visual and you know like thomas couldn't grasp the reality until he touched mm -hmm. jesus wounds god had so many anointed people in the old testament like moses that and everything we see of God's creation, and obviously Jesus was a physical person that we can see, but the Holy Spirit does so many things, but none of them visual, you know, mm -hmm. that we can yeah. touch mm -hmm. tangibly. And I think that's what makes it a little bit, a little bit harder for no somebody like myself. I'll, <laughs> no. I'll admit it that it's it's harder to study because it's 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 not physical. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Uh, there's a verse in the New Testament when you just it made me think of it where it talks about you know they believe because they've seen but you know in our generate we've not seen and yet we believe so blessed are those that believe and have not seen you know I mean we believe all this I'll correct myself faith. I said it's not physical I meant the evidence yes yeah, not yeah. Yo, I know I know I know, we know what you meant <laughs> but yeah I mean it is hard you know Yo, I mean I remember. I remember one of the hardest things for me to grasp when I started dating Joanna and I'd, I'd ask her, I'd say, all right, there's just one thing that, I, that can't boggles, uh, that just keeps, just, I can't overlook it. If, if, if God created everything, who created God? She's like, well, God always was. How's that possible? Like, how, how many years was he before he even started, you know, in the beginning? You know, how many years, like, when did that start? Well, it always was. What? <laughs> like, <laughs> what? You know, but it's again, like it's, out of our it's like in, in one of the things just recently that Pastor Eric shared is, well, he's out of our time and space. <laughs> and that helped. Him. Oh, okay. <laughs> you know, like it's a different time and space. You know, but I'm still struggling with that. How? How is that even possible? I mean, eternity. I mean, do you realize how long eternity is? It's a, yeah, so the Holy Spirit is, yeah, it's... <laughs> That's why it said you'll lose your mind, <laughs> you know, but, uh, you know, yeah, it's, yeah. I mean, I'm a, uh, more of a kinesthetic learner. I like to do, I learn hands-on. Uh, some are visual, you know, they learn by seeing and then auditory, you know, lip, lip, hearing, you know, so, you know, some people will hear this and they'll just, oh, okay. Others need a little, like Thomas, need a little bit more proof and, you know, I don't think it makes us any weaker it just makes us different God created us that way and uh, that's why we have other people with faith who believe it and can share it and can teach it and, and hopefully through their faith our faith is, is strengthened so even though we don't see I mean you know, I have so many you know <laughs> you know I, I'll share this and if anybody else wants to, to share I mean my faith was just solidified and like I mean brought to my knees you know, the night that we uh, had the elders come over to anoint Micah with oil uh, and Pastor uh, Doug and, uh, you know, following James 5, you know, um, having the elders do that and the power of prayer that night just rocked my world. And the presence that I felt, 
you know, it was just different. I've never felt anything like that except for when I was at the Brooklyn Tabernacle during the prayer service. But, um, but uh, those were the two two biggest moments in my life where I was just like, wow. And that, if I could say that the the Holy Spirit was there, that was a that was a huge, two huge um, times in my life that were just like, yeah, it's real. Why don't I tap into it more? You know. Um, so, any other thoughts or? But that's as close as physical and real I, I got. But it spoke. God spoke to me. So, I yeah. think the average, uh, uh, what I always think, something has to be contained. Mm -hmm. Where does the world end? Every moon, every star, every thing that keeps on going, going, going. But it says God had no beginning and has no end. So this is how I answer <laughs> that. I always think something has to be contained within something. Mm -hmm. It's in your. I think even science teaches that something has to be contained. Well, God, He was in the beginning. He always was, and there never will be no end. So that's how I answer my problem. When I'm saying the earth has to be contained. Where do you go from here? Mm -hmm. Just like, yeah, just like uh, this thing when you're off the ocean. You know, the ocean was flat and went off the edge. Well, that's I'm looking at. Looking at space and the big thing coming now with the uh, eclipse. People are. Ever seen people so excited about an eclipse? Yes. I mean, it's it's a big thing. <laughs> People's gonna make a lot of money. So if I see it, I see it. If I don't, I don't. It doesn't mean nothing to me. But mm -hmm. I, I I answer it all. God had no beginning. How that is, the human mind can't say, and He has no end. I can't think that. I only thank God that He talked to me through His Spirit that I believe it. And that, that's the way I answer it. Yeah. And that's where Pastor Brad and and Natalie and. The, the scriptures that were, were shared when the New Testament talks about the Comforter and how the Spirit will help us understand scripture. And that's why I said, you know, back in God the Father, you know, the revelation, when I talked about general revelation, God reveals himself to us, but he's only going to reveal himself if we're willing to dig deeper. And the more we dig deeper, the more he reveals to us. And as believers, that's done through the Holy Spirit now. And, you know, so the more we study the Bible, the more we're fellowshipping and worshiping with one another, the more the Holy Spirit helps us and understand and reveals to us God, you know. And I think that's where the peace comes in my mind now that, you know, oh, you know what? God always was. You know, he's the Alpha and the Omega. <laughs> and uh, it's okay, you know. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, thanks for sharing. Hopefully... Uh, Hopefully you'll enjoy the study. <laughs>